Welcome. It's such a blessing to come to you again. In this video, I want you to declare that it's your miracle day. If I could persuade you to believe what tonight I hope I will, I will try to. Your entire world would change. You hear the word God, the word Jehovah, the word Lord, the word Jesus, the word Christ, and you think of something other than yourself, one that is greater, one that you would worship. Tonight it is my purpose to show you that God and the eye of man are one. When you say, I am, that is the God of Scripture. Confined as you are, you think, how could it be? God created the universe and sustained it. And here I am, like a little worm, three scored in ten years, and then I vanish. But now let us turn to Scripture. We turn now to the 16th chapter of Matthew. And the question is asked of the disciples, the followers, those who have heard him. And he say to them, who do men say that the Son of Man is? And they reply, well some say, John the Baptist, come again. Others Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And then he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And the spokesman called Peter, answered and said, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And he said to him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood could not have told you this, but my Father who is in heaven. Well, here he equates the Son of Man with the eye of man, not the organ that sees or through which you see, but your sense of awareness that I am this, when you are aware of being, your consciousness, your human imagination. So he equates the two, the Son of Man spoken of in the Old Testament and brought forward into the New is nothing more than the I of man. And he calls it the Christ and defines Christ as the Son of God. Now we find Christ being defined in the New Testament as the power of God and the wisdom of God. So the eye of man is the power of God and the wisdom of God. If man does not know it, well then he will not exercise that power. He will not exercise that wisdom. So tonight I am trying to persuade you that when you say I, before you say anything, that that is the power and the wisdom of God. You can separate the power of God and the wisdom of God from God. So you will say in the end, I and my Father are one, for he is called the Son of God. Now we are called upon to test this, if it be true. Can we test it? I hope you'll put it to the test. When I tell you that your own wonderful I amness is God, though prior to that you believe that you are little something, moving across the earth for a few years, 70 years, and then you will vanish in the hope of some restoration, but a hope, no assurance. But now I'm going to tell you that you really are God. Your own wonderful consciousness, your human imagination, that is the God 
of Scripture. And there is no other God. Imprisoned as you are in these bodies of flesh, you did it for a purpose. Now let us see what it tells us about this son of man that is now equated with the I of man. No one has ever ascended into heaven, but he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. You'll read that in the third chapter, the 13th verse of John. So here we find you are a pre-existent being. No one can ascend into heaven, but he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. Your ascension in the next verse, the 14th verse, is showing you how you ascend. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. That's all imagery, and yet it is true. You descended into generation in a world of death where everything begins, it waxes, it wanes, and then it disappears. But there's something in you clothed in this garment that does die, that is pre-existent, and its home is heaven which is harmony. You gave it up completely. You aren't pretending that you're a man. You descended into man. You became man. With all the weaknesses, all the limitations, all the restrictions of man, to experience this world of death and decay. There will come a moment in time that you will ascend from this restriction taking with you the experience that is yours because of this restriction. And you will ascend in the same manner that Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. That was an adumbration. That was a foreshadowing. You will rise from the base of your spine, up your spine into your own skull, for heaven is within you. And you will rise like a fiery serpent. Without any loss of identity. The form you wear, I hesitate to describe it. I will tell you that your face is human. Your hands are human. Your voice is human. But do not ask me to describe the body that you wear. <coughs> It's infinite power, infinite wisdom, and yet it is a form. You are that fiery being that descended, not because of anything that was wrong when you descended. The fall is not because of any mistake on our part. It's a predetermined plan to come down into the world of death and decay and overcome it. If coming down, wearing these garments, we knew who we were, pretending that we were men, we could not accomplish it. Any more than an actor on the stage, pretending that he is Hamlet, can actually play that part. He has to actually assume it, but even then it is still with a little Something in his mind, he knows he is the great actor who tonight will go home to his lovely home and he'll take off the garment and hang it up once more and tomorrow he'll replay the play. You don't do that in this play of God. You don't take off the garment. You wear it for your three score in ten and if by strength, your four score or maybe even longer or shorter. But the eye of man is the God of Scripture. Put it to the test. Let me now, first of all, before we go into the testing of it, make clear what I said on the last lecture night, Friday night. 
prompted by a question that was asked to him. For I had said in the previous lecture that there are ranks in heaven as they are on earth. For this is only a copy. Everything here is a shadow. It's a copy of the eternal realities. Believe me that when you say I, before you say I am John, I am Bill, I am this, I am that, I am the other, you are declaring yourself to be, and that sense of being is God. That's God. Now what are you going to put on it? All things are possible to God. All things. You could say now, as you're seated here, after first affirming that I am, you could then assume that I am, and you name exactly what you want to be. If you believe what I tell you about your own I amness, and remain faithful to what you have assumed, that assumption will harden into fact. When you pray, in the true sense of the word, you do not pray to any external God. Everything he creates from within himself. And this pattern, the individual awakens within himself. And who does it? The I of man. And that is God. Now tonight you can test it. As you are called upon to test it. Test yourselves and see. Do you not realize that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless, of course, you fail to meet the test. Examine yourself to see whether you are holding to the faith. What faith? To have someone tell me that I am a Christian, or I am a Jew, or a Mohammedan, and holding to that faith that they talk about? No. The faith that I'm talking about tonight. That your own wonderful I amness is God. Test it to see if you're holding to that faith. If you're holding to that faith and all things are possible to God, you should be able to prove it in the testing. Having convinced myself through experience I have come to the conclusion that because I am aware that I am, that there is God. For if by him all things are made, and without him is not anything made that is made, and I start from scratch, only imagining a state, and then I boldly assume that it is real, that I am actually experiencing that state now. And then in the not distant future, that state crystallizes in my world. Well then I have found God. I have found the source of the phenomena of life. My only concern then is to share it with others and tell them, for they're all one. We are one. No one is greater than the other, not fundamentally. In his claims of what he is, in the world of Caesar, he has more money, or he has so-and-so and so-and-so, -and -so, but basically the same creative power in the man tonight behind bars, serving life, is the same creative power of the one who sentenced him to life. Is the same being. There is only one God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord, our God, the Lord is one. And the word translated, the Lord, is Yod He Vav He. Properly translated is I am. When you go unto the people of Israel and they ask you, what is his name? And you claim, that the God of Abraham and the God of Jacob and the God of Isaac sent you. You say unto them, I am has sent me. That's my name forever. And by this name I shall be known throughout all generations. 
But man finds it difficult keeping the tent. And so he speaks of thou art, or he is. And he never actually comes down to the fundamental and knows that I am. I am the cause of the phenomena of my life, good, bad, or indifferent. I have to live with it and change my assumptions if I would change the world in which I live. But now, can I have a seeming other? I say you are myself pushed out. Can I help another? Yes, because there's only one. If your request of me comes within the framework of the golden rule, something that I would like done to me, then I can willingly help you. If you ask of me that which does not come within the frame of the golden rule, do not ask it of me. I grant you complete freedom to go elsewhere and go to anyone who will tell you they can do it in spite of what he said. Go ahead. But if anyone asks of me any request, all that I do is this. It's so simple. We are told in Scripture, whatever we ask of him, knowing that he hears it, it shall be done for us. If we know he hears it. Well, can you imagine you seated here on the surface of your being, a rational being, knowing something that the depth of your own being that encompasses you doesn't know? So you know, and you think, well, he doesn't know. Well, read that in the story of Ezekiel. You'll read it in the 38th chapter. And these are the elders of Israel that went into the dark room. And they are carving on the walls all gruesome things. And they say within themselves, the Lord does not see us. And the Lord is speaking to his prophet Ezekiel. And he said, the elders of Israel say that I do not see them. And watch what they're doing making all these abominable things within the great cavern. They will all read them. Because I see everything that the elders of Israel see. But they think because it's dark and it's a cavern. No one knows what he's doing. But God doesn't know it. I've said time and again, there is no fiction in this world. When you pray, go within and close the door of the senses. Deny all that seems so obvious. And your Father who is within will reward you openly. But commune with self, for you and the Father are one. So you commune with self. And what does he tell you? Exactly what was asked of you. He heard it, and he has all the ways and means that you on the surface of your being know not of. He will do it. You can ask anything of one if it comes within the framework of his code of ethics. Don't ask anyone who knows how to pray something that does not come within his golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Just as simple as that. And most of the requests would come within that rule. And so you simply hear it. And then you drop it completely. And in the depths of your own being you're still hearing it, and the Father knows all means, all ways, and so he singles out the best way to externalize it. Type Amen if you feel abundant. Watch this important message right now.